Hello and welcome to this, a discussion on the coronavirus and the implications of the British government's response to this. A discussion between Mail on Sunday columnist Peter Hitchens and the Bow Group's chair Ben Harris Quinney. I'm Michael Curzon, the editor of Bournebrook magazine, and I ask a few questions to lead the discussion, but really leave it mostly to them to battle through with their ideas. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. I know that the two of you are allies on a, on a number of fronts, but noticeably not this one. Um, and I thought uh, an interesting way to start the discussion would be to um, look at the way the papers have been reporting on the coronavirus uh, recently and talking about fronts. We've heard a lot, especially with Boris now being in hospital, um, about Boris carrying out a Churchillian effort to get through um, his own fight against coronavirus and also in the country's fight generally against coronavirus. And I thought if I could start with Ben, if that's OK, just by asking if... This warlike rhetoric is justified, whether the national effort is in, in line with a war or whether this is perhaps overblown. Well, it's, uh, it, it's quite extraordinary from my point of view how similar, actually, um, or how many parallels there are to the Second World War. Um, I, there was a, a joke I saw that someone said, I, I was wondering who the Vera Lynn of this crisis was going to be. Uh, it turns out it was Vera Lynn. Um, and obviously, a, a Majesty the Queen, in the address she gave yesterday, uh, echoed um, not only the wartime spirit, but a lot of the language used at the time. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, it's fine. It's, it's the sort of thing that, that goes on in, in crises. I think most people that have uh, watched governments and, and watch the press close at hand will take with a pinch of salt the kind of propaganda you get um, in times like these. And I've certainly heard Peter talking in the, in the same terms. Um, I don't think there's any real harm in it. I think it is a difficult time for the country and uh, many people take a huge amount of comfort in things like speeches by the Queen. And in Boris Johnson's case, um, there, there, I remember a quote from the Queen Mother regarding the, the Blitz that she felt going to see bomb sites uh, before she had experienced it firsthand um, was very difficult. But after Buckingham Palace was, was bombed, she, as she put it, was able to look the East End in the face. And so I think there'll be, a, uh, Boris will deploy that in a big way. He's someone who has not only had the virus, but clearly now suffered um, severe side effects because of it. Um, and and I, I think that will endear him to the public and has endeared him to the public. And if you look at the, the kind of language that has been coming from his friends and foes alike, it's it's been hugely supportive. Mm. Um, so, providing he does make a um, a full recovery, and uh, there's some question marks over that. I, I I I certainly don't think he'll be in serious trouble. But there's a qu question marks over what this does, what coronavirus does to your lungs, internal organs, and. Um, some things that are quite contrary, actually, to the herd immunity. Notion. Yes. But one one hopes he, he makes a full recovery, and I think it will actually be to his credit in terms of managing the crisis. Absolutely. If I may ask Mr Hitchens as well, what what do you think about this, this warlike rhetoric? Might it perhaps be a, a little overblown and perhaps even dangerous, or do you think there is also no harm in this? Well, first let me say that completely... Uh, to politics, everybody wishes Mr. Johnson well and a speedy mm. recovery. Be it's horrible being ill, and particularly horrible being ill when you're in the middle of a major national crisis, and uh, everybody, without any any concern for or any connection with any political feeling, simply does that. So let's get that established. In the first yes. Place. Uh, that having been said, I think that this country has for far too long been in the grip of the Second World War metaphor. Uh, so that almost everything appears to be referred back to Winston Churchill, the finest hour of the Battle of Britain, 
and whatever else it may be, and it, indeed Munich. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that the arrival of coronavirus in Britain has absolutely nothing in common with an enemy attack. Uh, cannot be dealt with by the same methods, and it's absurd, in my view, to compare the two in any way. I think we should uh, move on swiftly to a discussion of actual events rather than uh, this, this, this strange sentimental sentimentalization of something which is uh, actually not very sentimental. And if we can stick, if we can move on to that discussion, then, Mr. Hitchens, if I'll ask you first, um, of course, your main opposition with the measures which have been taken uh, by the government are on proportionality. Um, yes. Could you explain to us why you believe that the economic fallout as a result of uh, the, the measures taken by the government will be worse than the virus itself? Well, it, it already is in many ways, because it, it, every time one looks at the financial pages, one sees news of more uh, bankruptcies or approaching bankruptcies, and it doesn't take much observation in any area to see what's happening to small businesses in what is increasingly a service economy simply unable to function. And this, this cutting off of the, of, of the lifeblood of the economy uh, for week after week after week is immensely, uh, profoundly and permanently damaging. And of course, the people will say, well, what do you care about money more than people? And I would say, absolutely not. I, I, I tire of this, this foolish uh, accusation. I assume that my opponents uh, have good intentions and I would ask them to do me the same favor. Uh, the point is this, that if you destroy or severely damage an economy, you will gravely damage the health of the people. And not merely will it become increasingly difficult to afford the sort of national health service which we are already struggling to pay for hmm. out of the diminished tax revenues which will result, uh, but also in poor countries, the general standards of all kinds of things for particularly housing. Uh, inevitably, the standards of, of, of hygiene and other things in food will, will will fall and become harder to enforce, and these things will have profound effects on health, the, 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 the quality of life of people will decline. And then you have on top of that the, the effects of the shutdown, uh, particularly on the healthy old, and this, the curious uh, use by the government of exercise as a sort of reward for, for, for good behaviour in, in, in a kind of collective punishment threat, which it, it keeps on hinting at. Uh, if the, the old and healthy have stayed healthy, largely a result of having active social lives and engagements, and also from being themselves physically active and taking exercise. The, the, the social side of their lives has been destroyed, and immensely demoralizing that is for many of them. This is what uh, Professor Dr. Sushrit Bhakti of the University of Mainz has pointed out. It's so extraordinarily damaging. Uh, and if the, if the shutdown has intensified, as Mr. Hancock seems to suggest it would at one point on Sunday, uh, then if people are deprived of exercise and deprived of the freedom to go outside, then that will, beyond doubt, uh, condemn a number of people to a far earlier death and many more diseases than they would otherwise have suffered. Because if there's one way of making sure people become ill, it's depriving them of exercise. So if, if you're simply looking at it from a health point of view, as we're always told it is, it doesn't work. Uh, the, the other thing, of course, is, is just exactly how big is this crisis, how serious uh, is the disease in comparison to, and, and here I, I will be accused by somebody at some point in this conversation, I think, of claiming that COVID-19 is like flu or the same as flu. It isn't. I haven't said that. I won't say that. I don't believe it. On the other hand, what is the case is that there have been severe influenza epidemics with large complications in recent years in this country, which have killed very large numbers of people, and about which there has not been any sort of comparable fuss. And there was, I think, in, in 2014-15, uh, the, the numbers who died in England alone were 28,330. The average number of deaths each year from influenza complications is 17,000. Uh, these are figures which, as yet, I'm happy to say COVID-19 hasn't reached. It may reach them. Uh, it, 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 it may be exactly comparable with them. It may be, it may be larger. But I think it's at the moment it's very hard to argue that what we face is actually significantly bigger than other things which have not led uh, to a response of this scale. And the response, the scale of the response, is extraordinary. Somebody said to me earlier on today that it was better to be safe than sorry. But leaving aside the attacks on personal liberty which have taken place, mm. I can't see anything safe at all about crashing an economy which was already pretty wobbly. 
Well, Ben, you, um, we, we'll talk in a moment about the about predicted deaths because there's a, a question I wanted to ask about that. But on the proportionality then of the measures, why is it if you do that you disagree with Peter on this and think that the actions are justifiable and won't lead to a worse fallout? I don't necessarily think that. I think the fallout will be horrific. Where I where I disagree with Peter is um, a. I think the disease is very serious, the virus is very serious, um, and will result in a very, very large number of, of deaths. Um, and B, I think the only way, uh, as, as faulty as it is, the only way to, to try and ease the inevitable burden that comes with this virus on the NHS and therefore to try and level out uh, the the amount of strain and, and the deaths that it causes is to take the actions the government have taken. We recommended different actions earlier on, but based upon where we are now, the government has allowed this virus to take very significant hold in the United Kingdom. And therefore, um, the only way to deal with it, if you don't have a comprehensive system of testing um, or, or a vaccine or anything to ameliorate the, um, the, the, the results of the virus, the, the, the severe health results of the virus, then um, a, a lockdown and, and preventing the spread of the virus is really the only option left available to you. And I, I remember a graphic that was being shared um, only about two weeks ago that showed deaths per day of, of the myriad of, of serious other diseases that we have in society, including seasonal flu. And COVID-19 was killing about 50 people a day at that point globally. Um, tuberculosis, I think, was at the top, killing about 3,000 people a day. Well, in the space of two weeks, COVID-19 coronavirus has gone right to the top of that scale and it is absolutely true what what peter says that flu kills um many many thousands of people each year in the uk and, and many more worldwide coronavirus does not kill people usually instead of the flu it will kill people as well as the flu and coronavirus from everything we can understand is, is a novel virus and very much in its infancy. So it has killed uh, between five and 6,000 people in the UK so far, we think. However, as the months progress, that number will, of course, continue to climb. And from everything I have looked at, I find it unlikely that the government is going, or the, the health sector, the... the um, the best minds in the world, with the best will in the world, I don't see a way that they develop an effective vaccine for this um, in in the next few months. And even if a vaccine is developed eventually, because of the type of virus it is, it, it is likely the virus will continue to mutate and that vaccines will, will not be a panacea, will not be effective in dealing with it. So... It's, it's likely that coronavirus is a new normal. Therefore, it's going to kill a lot of people. It is very serious. And what needs to be done is the health services need to be retooled to cope with it, which means increasing ICU capacity, increasing ventilator capacity. And the only way to do that is to try and delay the virus as much as possible by taking the draconian measures that have been taken across the world um, but the idea that the methods that have been taken will, will solve this crisis or this will uh, cease to be very serious into the future and most pointedly that the economic fallout won't be extremely serious um, I, I, I think that uh, all of those things are very much in question. There is no certainty. And Peter is right to question all the things that he's questioning. And I think that whilst I disagree with him on the severity of the virus and what the government should be doing, um, the economic fallout will almost certainly be very severe. Um, and so the debate has to be, because of the severity, life versus life. It has to be how many lives... Will, will doing nothing 
um, on coronavirus cost and how many lives will a very severe economic downturn cost. I think um, depending on where you where you move the policy levers, there, there was no way to get through this without any deaths and there was no way to get through this without any economic fallout no. because of the way that the economy is structured. Peter alluded to the, the, um, the extent to which confidence is underwriting the, the, the modern UK and global economy. Um, the, those, those shocks can be very serious and can sort of deflate the bubble very quickly. So um, my conclusion is that the government had no choice but to do what it did. And the genesis of that choice was slightly different to what Peter presents in that um, when they were starting out, they were talking about things like herd immunity. They were much more relaxed than other countries. Um, And I think they were hoping that they could uh, leave more elements of the economy functional but i think what what convinced them was seeing how this has progressed so quickly in italy and spain and realizing that our icu capacity was more similar to those countries than a country like germany and feeling that they they had no choice but to take the decisions they did because the loss of life would would be so great and talking about loss of life miss hitchens if i can turn to you the one of the main uh, points which you've picked up on when uh, the the point of severity and the numbers of deaths which will result from this um, is the difference between uh, deaths resulting from coronavirus and the deaths of people with coronavirus. To what extent do you think this difference hasn't been picked up enough by the uh, by the media and by the politicians as well? Well, it's extraordinary. If you if you want to hide something, you hide it in plain sight. Sight, it seems to me. But it, I I remain utterly astonished. Uh, after the powerful article by John Lee, Professor John Lee, a, a distinguished pathologist and the spectator of the week before last, in which he explained that the, the, the registration of COVID-19 as a notifiable disease had meant that all kinds of deaths were being recorded as COVID-19 deaths, which uh, in which COVID-19 was present, but it couldn't necessarily uh, be described as the cause of death. I, I, I'm not going to name a particular celebrity who died recently about him. Some of the papers are writing as, as having had a final struggle with COVID-19. But the celebrity to whom I'm referring had had a full heart transplant uh, not all that long ago. Um, had, uh, had recently then been, been, he'd actually been in hospital receiving treatment for heart failure and had suffered from kidney and heart problems for a number of years. He was 78, but the, the, the media are largely reporting that this, this person, may God rest his soul, died of COVID-19. I think that's misleading. And I would also point out that during the, the government press conference on Sunday, uh, Dr. Jenny Harris, the deputy chief medical officer, actually said after giving the numbers of, of, of deaths which are read out each day, these are COVID-associated deaths. They're all sad events. They would not all be a death as a result of COVID. Now, no one has actually come back and said at any of these press conferences, well, okay, well, how many of them are as a result of COVID? And I think there is a serious misunderstanding here in the media, uh, which the government are doing nothing to discourage, uh, that the, the COVID-19 is, is, act, is the active killer in cases where it's present. But it is, it, in fact, the people involved are, in many cases, often very old and quite seriously ill. Now, it's, it's not to say that they mightn't, under certain other circumstances, have lived on uh, in for some time, and we all regret these deaths and, and would wish that they had not happened when they did. But again, what one is talking about here is proportionality, that not all death can be prevented. Everybody dies in the end. We all have a fatal disease called life. As a result, 1,600 of us uh, uh, die every day in this country. And, and that will happen whatever government does within, uh, obviously that's an average figure. So it, what, what, is the, what is the purpose of this? And we're, we're told, we're told again, that, that the government had no alternative. Well, it most definitely did have an alternative. My, my distinguished colleague, Ian Gallagher, the chief reporter for the Mail on Sunday, interviewed uh, last week uh, Anders Tegnell, the epidemiologist who runs the Swedish policy. He, he trained here. 
he knows all about what's going on here. Uh, he's kept Sweden largely open, and he thinks that we made a mistake by doing what we did. And it's, it's quite plain that the government consulted some experts and, uh, and, and decided to agree with them. It doesn't seem to me to have, have widened its, it, it, its search for information to any other experts. And they say, I, I also referred repeatedly to Professor Dr. Sutrit Bhakti, uh, in the University of Mainz is very much against these measures. And on the statistical matter, which is, is crucial because the, the claims of the death rate from coronavirus are absurd, uh, the, the, the intervention of Dr. John Ioannidis uh, of Stanford University in California, who points out that the death rates being posted simply have bear no relation to reality at all, uh, is vital. And yet you don't get any sense that ministers are even aware of this. Uh, then leave that aside. How do we get out of this? If you, once you have committed yourself to a policy of this kind, there isn't any easy way to say, actually, uh, now's the time to stop, even if uh, the, the economy is running on empty, which it is. And, and this is the really serious thing. What will happen uh, when we finally get back, people who've been furloughed and getting their 80% get back, and, and many of them may well find, I think, that they go back to jobs which have disappeared in companies which have folded. And this is happening all the time, over and over and over again. You see the number of people in airlines, in major shop chains, and you see what's happening in the myriad small businesses. The, the amazing uh, shutdown, which seems to me to be extremely anomalous, by the way, the shutdown of small builders, whereas large building firms seem to be allowed to continue to, to, to do their work. And the, some shops are allowed to open on a completely inconsistent basis. You can buy food, uh, but you can't buy anything else. Uh, what is going on here? What is the purpose of it? What is it achieving? And the, the other thing with the there is no alternative um, bunch is that I say to them again and again, what evidence have you that this procedure is actually achieving what you say it is? From all the countries which have suffered so far from outbreaks of COVID-19, we have a completely variable picture. From China, from South Korea, from Hong Kong and Singapore, the United States, Germany, France, Spain, the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway and Denmark have all taken measures which have differed. There is no pattern in the, in the outcomes of these measures which can show that any particular measure has any particular effect. Uh, absolutely none. So there's neither a correlation nor a, cause, nor a causation which says that this policy is justified. And yet we pursue it doggedly. I believe, because the government decided to do it and now can't think of a way of getting out of it. And Ben, what do you think about that? Firstly, the point um, that there's a contradictory nature uh, within the shutdown, that the fact that big businesses have been allowed to stay open, whereas smaller open-air markets, for example, have been closed. Do you think that this is particularly bad? And also on the second point of the evidence that the, the shutdown will itself lead to a reduction in the number of uh, lost lives? point um I, I think what what peter tends to be very good at and what he has done in what he said just then is really teased out the fact that the government doesn't really know what it's doing um, correct and you know that's that's something that i experience on a very regular basis as well um and i think it's accurate um, when, when you when you look at how some of these things have come into effect they've been sort of off the cuff of remarks on the marsh well how long should people exercise oh, an hour um you know the, these it's quite clear that there's been a lack of preparation at government level um and so these sorts of uh, inconsistencies like large building firms can carry on but small building firms can't the, 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 this is policy being made as it comes out of people's mouths it would appear and uh I, I don't think that there's any justification for that. But that doesn't mean that the virus isn't very serious. And actually, the, the version of events that Peter presents is that the government has always been very hot and heavy on this harsh lockdown policy, whereas actually they, they weren't at all. We, we, the Bow Group, were talking about the seriousness that we perceived from the, 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 the severity of, of coronavirus that, that we had uh, plotted um, as far back as January, we were asking the government to take action to restrict flights from China, to, to do all of these things which at the time see, seemed very draconian. 
um, the government at the time was saying there's no risk to, to public health in Britain. Um, you, you'll remember only a few weeks ago, the Irish were closing schools, the UK government decided not to. Our border remains open. And you'll, you'll, you'll hear from the government that this is to repatriate people. Well, there's, there's, there's no need for the border to remain open to all and sundry to, to repatri repatriate people on, on charter form. Um, the reason for a lot of it is because the government uh, couldn't shut the border. The government couldn't, uh, didn't have the resources to impose some of the actions that have been recommended. So I think you, you, you have a government which, to some extent, understandably, is playing catch-up with the crisis, but I think they've, they've made some major errors. And the reason why people talk about having no other alternative than to take the very severe measures that they've taken, if you look at a country like South Korea, and yes, every country is different, and you, 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 you cannot put total faith in looking at a different country's model and saying that would absolutely work here. But the way the South Koreans restricted the spread was actually by enacting quite um, draconian measures to look at phone data, um, to test people for coronavirus, and to isolate those that had it and to work out those that they could have spread it to and isolate them as well. Other countries that have fared very well are countries like Hungary that have the comprehensive um, civil defence structure and, and very strong border controls that they can switch on um, and stop people getting into their country. In the UK, we, we had none of those facilities. We couldn't close our border because we don't have the resources to close our border. We didn't have the testing kits to be able to determine who had it and who didn't. And so they just had to pull the emergency lever of, well, everyone... Can, I, can, I, can I interrupt for a moment here? Please. Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I don't actually see very much connection between the measures which South Korea took and what then happened to the spread of COVID-19. Uh, I don't see how... My, I've never myself seen how testing uh, could in any way impede the spread of the disease. And I don't think it did. I think that the what, what seems to be the case is that in several countries, uh, COVID-19 has, has, has arrived, has spread, and then it, it appears to have begun to go away again without any necessary connection with any action which anybody's taken. There may be connections with actions that people have taken, but I don't know what they are. They haven't been established. Uh, I say it again. This policy, which is being pursued by the government with dogged uh, 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 persistence uh, and, uh, and, and a, a, a public refusal to reconsider that I think privately there's an awful lot of reconsideration going on in the cabinet uh, this, this, this government has, has, has chosen an extraordinarily dangerous policy with terrible implications for the economy and society which it cannot it, it, uh, here is a thing which I think we need to discuss pretty soon it cannot expect to be able to continue to impose much longer on people living in small crowded housing in hot dusty cities as the weather uh, as the weather warms up they're not going to be able to get people to carry on observing this very much longer uh, because people might be prepared to put up with it for a bit but the idea of it stretching out till to, to, to a, to a vaccine is invented is simply not uh, is, is not practicable uh, and it, it will not work and i'm not going to go into details as to what might conceivably happen if this goes wrong because you've got imaginations and i don't want to use words which anybody could claim were inflammatory, but the fact is, it, I think the government knows perfectly well that this cannot be sustained much longer. And I think if I could draw to a final question, as I know we're a little pressed by time, uh, one of the points within that is about the the power the government has to um, enforce such a lockdown and the infringement on liberty which the lockdown may or may not have brought. Ben, do you think that when this is over... Um, we our lives will go back to normal in in the sense of liberty and that there will have been no real problem with temporarily telling people to stay at home or do you think there might be a more long-term impact on this well I, I think much was made of, of the coronavirus act uh that, that went through parliament um i, I didn't see uh much difference between that and 
the original Emergency Powers Act and the Civil Contingencies Act. Um, I, I, so I, th- I, I think it was a good thing that they didn't just enact emergency powers. They brought something before Parliament. My concern about it um, is is not the powers that it, it gives government, which I think are necessary in a crisis, and this is a crisis. My concern is that the ceiling on it, the sunset clause on it, is two years, whereas... Uh, under the, the Civil Contingencies Act, it was 30 days, and I, I don't see a problem with 30 days, being that that can be re- renewed consistently month by month. Um, I don't think it would be too difficult to organise a situation where Parliament uh, can process votes without actually having to be in the chamber. Um, certainly... Uh, the, the, the technology at our disposal now, which has been highlighted with things like cabinet meetings going on remotely, um, should be able to facilitate better than ever that, that sort of situation. So um, I, I, I don't see this from a conspiratorial point of view that this is sort of some attempt to um, inject tyranny for the foreseeable future. Um, but I, I certainly would want to see very tight time limits on those powers because I think this is likely to be a virus that becomes a new normal. It's it's something like cancer or any other serious condition that, that people will die from in large numbers and therefore it shouldn't be the case that so long as coronavirus is around the government has these draconian powers. Uh, so and, and I've, I've saw Steve Baker vote for this bill in Parliament, but to make made, made those those same comments, and, and David Davis has has said similarly. So um, I'm, I'm you know I'm not I'm not so concerned about the powers. I'm concerned about how long they are in effect for. However, I don't see anything about this government that suggests to me that they wish to prolong this more than. Uh, is necessary or, or, or they wish to um, abuse the powers that have been given to them. I think uh, they have been forced into a corner because they acted quite late and there is evidence that this is causing a, a significant rise in deaths. You can distrust all the figures but you can observe how hospitals are being overwhelmed with an unusual amount of um People that are very seriously ill. Hang on, hang on, hang on. What are your what, are, what is the basis for your uh, for your saying that? What figures have you oh. seen on, on on occupation of acute beds in hospitals, which which backs that up? So if you if you look at what has happened in Italy, Spain, and then no, no, no I'm Italy. asking you, you, you. You've said that that hospitals are overwhelmed. I I've been trying to discover for some days uh, what the actual position is in hospitals. Uh, and, and what and, and how and how heavily press uh, intensive care units are. Uh, it may be because I'm incompetent with figures. It's quite possible, but or or, or bad at, at spreadsheets. But I have not seen any figures of any kind which either substantiate or or or, or indeed um, unsubstantiate that. And I'm just wondering if you're saying that. What is the basis for your saying it? Because I would really like to know where, where to find the figures which sure. you must have used to, to, to so confidently assert that. So the, so the basis for my saying it um, rests in the examples in northern Italy, in in Spain, in particularly in Catalonia. No, I'm asking about this country. Well, well in, in this country, we know that we haven't yet reached the, the, the ICU capacity, and that's been the government's well, strategy. Then, then, then why are you saying that, with the, the, that the hospitals are... are heavy pressure when they're not. Why are you saying that deaths are, deaths are rising? Again, I, I, I'm i not saying this isn't happening, but I'm saying I have not seen no, any figures. I'm not, oh, excuse me, but it's so important in these discussions that we get these things right. I have not seen any figures uh, which suggest that the actual death rate uh, is higher than it would normally be. Now, so that may be because the figures are behind or whatever it is, but I haven't seen them. Uh, I haven't seen figures showing a, an undue pressure on on hospital in, 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 um, intensive care units, uh, and I have, I have I have seen, as I mentioned earlier, which you haven't referred to, the uh, 
the the extraordinary frank statement by the deputy chief medical officer at yesterday's official press conference. These are COVID associated deaths. They're all sad events. They would not all be a death as a result of COVID. If we could have a response then, Ben, on that point. She's actually specifically conceded my point uh, that the that we are we are we are, desc- we are describing as COVID deaths deaths which in many cases are actually the deaths which are, are not the consequence of COVID itself. If, that, that assumes you're only looking at the United Kingdom. I give that assignment. That's, that's, that's what, I, what I am doing. Yes, because people are constantly trying to tell me that the uh, that, that the experiences of, of, of countries such as Sweden, uh, which are different from ours, don't count. Whereas the uh, because that doesn't suit their argument. Whereas the experiences of other countries such as Spain and Italy, which are utterly different from here, do. Uh, and I, well, I, think, I think that we, 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 we if, we're, if, if we're not allowed to uh, to agree on the on the use of the experience of foreign countries, let's stick to this one. Well, I don't I, I, I don't think it's relevant to look at the experiences of other countries. Um, in the in the specific cases of Italy uh, and Spain, you actually have a similarity with the United Kingdom because they have uh, per capita quite low levels of ventilator availability. If you compare that with a country like Germany, you, you, you can see a, a, not quite as many cases in Germany, but a very large number of cases, but a much lower mortality rate. Now, I well, would... mortality rates are meaningless because they're more, more, this is the whole point about Professor Professor John Ioannidis in Stanford. Yeah, we simply so you... don't. We, we're using figures for infections, which have absolutely no value right. at all. But, but, but what I would suggest, I mean, th- th- there's no way to know any of this to an absolute degree. But what I would say, I suppose, different from what you were saying, is that there is a value to looking at the examples of other countries that are further along than we are or that had their first case of coronavirus and their first death sooner than than we did in the United Kingdom. And my assertion, although I, I it's certainly not a fact, my assertion exactly. is, the reason, is the reason why uh, there are much there is a much lower mortality rate in Germany is because they have a a much higher ICU and ventilator per capita Rate yes, but that no, you can, but, uh, can, can, can we get back to the point of can we get back to the point of mortality rates? What are these mortality rates? What just what on what can these mortality rates possibly be based? We simply do well, not know. You're, you're, we simply right. do not know it, how many people have had the disease. Yeah. Right. We haven't a clue, it, and we're it, never, it, like, we're probably very unlikely ever to find out. So the mortality so, rates are basically that you put together the number of deaths. With people who've had, um, who, who, who've been tested with COVID, or, or indeed, as far as I can discover, judged without testing to have had COVID in some cases, you put, you, you make that figure, and then you put that alongside the number of people who you think may have had it. So, if we hear the response from that on Ben, then quickly. For government, for, 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 for a government policy. Which will which will wreck the British economy for decades to come. You're right. There's no way. I mean, I think the it's the current it's mortality it's rate complete statistical is, nonsense. The, the, the current mortality rate in the UK is is like 96 percent or something. Now but that's it's, also it's meaningless. It has it has, it no, has no right, meaning. Right. It's, it's, so it, the, it the, is the baseline is, is, is meaningless. We're not we're not testing anyone. So it's only the people who are severely ill with coronavirus that, that, that are falling into the category. So obviously those those numbers are accurate. But what we do know is that a very large amount of people, an, un, an unusual amount of people, have been uh, presenting with these symptoms in countries like Italy and Spain. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's, it's far, far more than in previous years so we know well, that there's wait a minute here again what, what do we what do we know about what do we know about italy again we know we definitely know about italy uh, that large numbers of, of, of the people who are, who are being listed as having covid 19 have been have been tested as having it present but that doesn't mean that they've died of it so we again have it this doesn't. complete we then we have this total dissonance between the between the figure and the actual numbers who died we simply do not know how many have died of it we we know, we know how many have died with it what we also know about italy is, is several very important things 
one, the, the huge preponderance of, of the victims of, of COVID-19, or supposed victims of COVID-19, of the dead in Italy are people of a very advanced ages. And this is actually a tribute to Italy's success, uh, largely because I think of its, its uh, excellent family structure in, 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 in extending the lives of the old in, in, in recent years. So Italy has a very, very high average age, much higher than almost any other country in the world. Uh, and then on top of that, you have the, the other extraneous circumstance, which is seldom mentioned, which is the extremely high uh, level of industrial pollution in Lombardy, uh, which is very, very bad for the respiratory systems of, of everybody who endures it, just as it is in China, which on the Eurasian landmass is about the only place worse than Lombardy. And then you have, as I say, the other thing which I, I, I part mentioned earlier, in Italy, and I believe in Spain as well, the extended family still very much exists. So the old, unlike in, in Britain and Germany, where they're, they're kept separately and often in, in care homes and seldom see the young, the old are living daily with the young, so the, the prospect of, 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 of transfer of disease from old to the young is much, much greater. So to draw any conclusions about Britain from what goes on in either Italy or Spain is risky. And then add to that the fact that both these countries, which have regressively recent experiences of authoritarian government, and both possess large paramilitary police forces, uh, have, uh, have imposed on their citizens, on many of their citizens, in the case of Italy, a regime of extraordinary severity. And what has happened? Has there been, as a result, a, a precipitous uh, drop some weeks after the, the imposition of these rules in the numbers of people uh, testing positive for COVID-19 and, 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 and dying? No, there has not. There's been no indication that this policy has been at all successful. So I, we should stop referring to Italy as any kind of example for us. It, 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 it's so different in so many different ways uh, that we really can't do it. Uh, if, if you want to talk about Britain, if you're going to say things about intensive care units or levels of death, then you're going to have to meet my challenges. What, what is the origin of your assertions about these numbers? Because statistically, I'm afraid these things are simply not available here, as far as I know. I've never been able to find them. Well, no, I I've think asked, you've... I've asked, I've asked much better statisticians than me to find them, and they're not there. You, you confuse my point with referring to this on a, on a global scale and it's national scale. Well, you changed scale. the subject to Italy when I asked you for no, things no, no, about Britain. I, I, I don't, I, no, I, I absolutely wasn't talking about Britain, because we know that in Britain the reason why... Uh, the, the lockdown measures have been put in place and, and large exhibition centres have been repurposed um, as hospitals was to try and stay ahead of the demand and they've successfully done so thus far. My concern and the Hang reason why... Uh, you, 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 I, no, wait a minute. If you could just... They've successfully done so, but actually what's happened is, is that it, it's not an indication of success. It's a fact... That these, that these, and, and let us rejoice over it. It's the fact that these emergency hospitals are not are not actually, I think, largely being used or certainly full at the moment. In fact, on on Friday, when the large new Nightingale Hospital in London was opened, the BBC's health editor said on the Today program that in fact the London intensive care hospital units were were coping with their workload, so nobody needed to go there that day. So, so we know that it's, we don't know the reason for that. We don't know why. We're putting we're, we're, we're putting two and two together and making seventeen and saying and saying we know it's, it's the classic no, I'm not, basic I'm not, error I'm not, of all arguments. The the if we just hear the response from that on Ben, yeah. I'm just saying that in the UK, uh, the, the hospitals are not yet at capacity where, where we know that they have been in Italy and Spain, or certainly parts of Italy and Spain. Now, the reason why, and I appreciate that every nation is different, the reason why I cited those European countries specifically is because they have a similar low per capita number of ventilators. And I think ultimately that, rather than any of any of the measures the government has have imposed about social distancing or lockdowns, um, th those, those things um, will be likely to have a, uh, a, a, a place of downward pressure on the rate that the virus is spreading. However, what I think, and it is not a fact, but what I think um, significantly dictates the mortality outcome is how many ventilators are available um, to, to, for, for each citizen for those that become very seriously ill. Do you have, do you have, a, do you have evidence for that? Uh, well, 
only from the countries that we can observe that are more advanced than we are in terms well, what, of... What is, what, what is the evidence about the effectiveness of ventilators? Uh, well, if you look at a country like Germany, um, Germany has, and I'm, I'm reaching for that, I, I, I believe we have among the lowest in Europe per capita um, for the amount of ventilators per citizen. Uh, Germany, I believe, is the highest. And okay, okay. Germany, well, I, 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 I'll, I'll, accept, I'll accept that, but that, that, we'll move on so to that. Germany has had approximately 80,000 cases, uh, reported cases of coronavirus. Now, I acknowledge that they have been testing more widely than, than we have in the UK, um, but not more widely than they have now in Italy. And their uh, number of deaths, despite having twice, I believe, the amount of cases as the UK, um, they've had about 1,500 deaths, where we've had already had approximately 6,000. So if we could have a response on that on that episode you're, from Hitch. You're, yeah. you're, making, you're making a, a jump from this is because of ventilators. You may be right. No, I'm, I'm saying that's my opinion. I, I, don't, know whether, I don't know whether you're right or wrong. Right. I'm saying, what, what, is it, what is the reasoning which leads you to this position? Because we know that, um, at least we know what uh, doctors have said, that people who experience the most severe symptoms from coronavirus and decline into pneumonia require that ventilator support to keep the oxygen levels in their blood um, high enough to prevent them from, from dying, prevent their organs from shutting down. And, of course, if you don't have enough ventilators, it's really rather pointless being in hospital. I mean, that's why the Nightingale hospitals, um, there's a big question mark over their efficacy, because if they're just banks and banks of beds with no ventilators, you might as well be at home. Um, but in, in Germany... They, whilst they've had a, a very large amount of cases, they haven't had um, their wards being overwhelmed, so people cannot be put in those ventilators. That is what happened in Italy. And in Italy, they were saying to people, you know, saying to the over 80s, I'm, there's no, there's not really ventilators for you because. Well, okay, I, mean, I just, I just, I, I would just draw to your attention um, an article on the Spectator website by by Matt Strauss a critical care physician who specializes in the use of, of ventilators, uh, who is skeptical about them as any kind of miracle treatment for, um, for COVID-19. I, I, I just, I'm not sure. Again, I, I don't come to this as someone claiming to have facts which I don't have. I just hear a lot of things being said. No, not. When I examine them, turn out not to be quite as, as obvious as they were when they began. Uh, but the government appears to have a number of ideas fixed in its head. And uh, what is, well, that's what governments are like. But what, what is the problem is neither the opposition uh, nor most of the media, uh, nor civil society as a whole, uh, nor any um, part of our society really has, has, has questioned any of this. And yet, the, at the heart of the government's policy, which I have no doubt is well intentioned, I don't doubt the good intentions of this government, but the heart of the government policy is that the most extraordinary uh, destruction being wreaked on an economy which was already shaky when they began. And as we know, and as I think you agree, and I, I, I'll, I'll sign off after I've said this because it seems to me to be so important. <laughs> if our economy uh, is severely damaged, then our ability to sustain the health of the people, to treat the sick, and to save the poor from the consequences of, of bad living conditions will be hugely, disastrously reduced. And at the same time, all kinds of other, as it were, collateral damage, particularly to the currently old and well, will follow from a lengthy shutdown of social life, and especially if the government then goes on to institute its threatened collective punishment of, of refusing to allow people to exercise outside. I, and, I, and then on top of that, we have, and I, I, I can't, again, um, I, I won't say any more than this, but the, the extreme difficulty with the summer months coming 
of maintaining uh, what is effectively uh, confinement to people's homes uh, into the depths of the summer. I don't know how it can be managed. And, and until people, until intelligent people in civil society find the courage to say this policy is a mistake and the government must rethink it, then we are heading, it seems to me, towards a number uh, of, of coincident I won't say disasters, but certainly uh, very bad outcomes, which are avoidable if only more people would speak up against it and say, this, is, this, is, this has to be criticised. What we need, and the whole purpose of having a free society is what we should have, is an opposition which criticises there is no policy which cannot be improved by intelligent opposition and criticism. This policy has had neither. Now, Mr. Harris Quinney had the, had the first word, so I think it's fair, Mr. Hitchens. I hope that you have the last word, and I'm very grateful uh, to both of you for your time, and hope you have good evenings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful to Peter Hitchens and Ben Harris Quinney for their time in discussing this topic with us, and hope that you join us again for our next video. Thanks a lot.